Imagine with me this scenario. Every morning, $86,000 is deposited into your bank account. You can use it however you'd like. And the best part is, the very next morning, you get another $86,000. And in fact, that happens every morning from now till the end of your life. How would you like that? All right, you guys are more godly than I. I would be like, sweet. Um, but there's a catch. Of course there's a catch. You know, even in an imaginary situation like that, there's a catch. And the catch is, at the end of the day, any cash you have not used vanishes forever. Now, if this was the case, I'm sure you would do your best every day to spend every last dollar of that $86,000, right? I mean, what would you do with that? I mean, probably for a lot of you, you would use it all to pay off loans for going to school here. Uh, but let's say you pay that off after a week, you know, a couple weeks maybe. And uh, what else would you do? I'm sure you would maybe help your parents out, maybe, you know, pay off that house uh, mortgage for them, maybe buy them a new car, buy yourself a new car maybe. Uh, maybe you would uh, support the Lord's work and you would, you would send out some missionaries. You would, you would support some missionaries at the church. And maybe you'd be very generous to your friends at Grace on Campus and to your faithful leader and say, free Chick-fil-A on me tonight for everybody. Everything on the menu, free. And of course, you would probably spend some money on yourself. You know, you'd buy that, that new iPad. You'd buy that, you know, that fabric to make some more clothes if you're Caroline. You know. You would, you would probably spend money on yourself, and that's fine. I mean, $86,000 every day, that's a lot of money. I, I think it would be hard to spend that much money. Have you ever heard the saying that time is money? Time is money. Every morning, God does not give you $86,000, but he gives you a little bit over 86,000 seconds. Every morning, God gives you 86,000 seconds, and any time that you don't use, that day is gone forever. Poof. Gone. You never get any of those seconds back, not even one. Most of you would never dream of letting money disappear from your bank account without using it for something. But how many of us take a much more laid-back approach to our time? How many of us, how many of you, from time to time, waste your time? God gives every single person the exact same amount of time every day, and some people get lots done, and some people get very little done. But everyone gets the same amount of time. And the only difference is, how did you use your time that day? As believers, we want to make the best use of our time because we understand that our lives, our time, is a gift from God, right? Our time is not our own. Our lives are not our own. They're all a gift from God. And you know the saying, right? What we do in life echoes in eternity. Our, our lives are just a brief moment in the span of eternity. And what we do in this life echoes in eternity. And it's also true that what you do in college, the habits you form now, will echo for the rest of your lives. The habits you form will form who you become. The habits you form now will form who you become. And whether you realize it or not, the most valuable thing you have is your time. And that's why it's essential, it's absolutely necessary that you learn how to spend it well. And, and, and it's important that you know how God wants you to spend your time. Or rather, his time that he's given you. So tonight we're going to be studying Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 16. And, and these verses are going to teach us how to use our time wisely. Uh, for those of you guys who are new, or maybe it's been such a long summer that you returning GeoSeers have forgotten to, we, we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians, right? We've been work, working our way through the book of Ephesians, and we got to the middle of chapter 5 last year, and we're picking up this year at verse 15. 
So while you are turning there, or if you're already there, let me explain the context to you a little bit just to remind you and refresh your memory. For those of you who are new, uh, Ephesians 1-3 to describes the calling of the church. Ephesians 4 to 6, there are six chapters. 1 to 3 is the calling of the church. 4 to 6 is the conduct of the church. 1 to 3 is what is true, what has God done for you. It's, it's talking about God's grace, how he's saved us, how we were dead in our sins, and he's made us alive together with Christ. It talks about how he has, he has uh, chosen us before the foundation of the world. Amazing truths in chapters 1 to 3. And then in chapters 4 to 6, it says, because of what God has done for you, now you should live this way. You guys remember that? Those of you guys who were here last year? 1 to 3, the calling of the church. 4 to 6, the conduct of the church. 1 to 3 is kind of like the, the fuel, the gasoline that, that empowers your Christian life because it's, it's all about the gospel and what God has done for you. And the chapters 4 to 6 is what God expects of you after you've been saved. It's, it's not about saying, you know what? I obey, therefore I'm accepted. That's not what Christianity is. That's, that's what religion says. Re, the religions of the world say, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. The gospel says, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. And that's so important. So Ephesians 1-3 to is talking about the fact that we have been accepted by God, even though we are sinners, even though we have rebelled against Him, yet in His love for us, He has sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Didn't deserve it, couldn't do it on our own, and we're saved by faith. By faith, not by being good enough. And so this is the, I'm accepted. And then now chapters 4 to 6 is, therefore I obey. Because of what God's done for me, I want to obey Him and love Him and serve Him. And so chapter 5 obviously falls in the second half, right? So this is the response to what God has done for us. It's not just use your time well or else. It's use your time well because God has bought you with a price. God has saved you. He's redeemed you. And the main point of the book of Ephesians is really summed up in in a statement that kind of captures all of that. Live in a manner worthy of your calling. Live in a manner that matches your calling. Live in a way that, that, that shows how worthy God is because of what he's done for you. So, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Let's read that. Uh, Follow along as I read it out loud. Verse 15 says, Therefore, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Now usually we take a bit longer chunks than that. We're only going to do two verses tonight. And the reason why is because I suspect that as college students and college age students, I already see LB smiling. Use of time is not always the easiest thing to, to manage, right? Can I get some, some nods? Is that, is that about right? You have, some of you find this hard to believe, but you have a lot of time as a college student. Where does it all go? I don't know. <laughs> Ask yourself. But, but I want to slow down and just take these two verses in particular tonight because I know that when I was in college, man, it was very easy to just squander time. And if the same is true for you tonight, this isn't going to be a how-to, 12 steps to do this or do that. That's not what this is about. This is going to be about pretty much a kick in the pants to say, because of what God's done for you, let's, let's live in a way that we make the most of our time. This is an encouragement to say, live in a way that, that honors God. Live in a way that shows how worthy God is of your life. So, We're only going to look at those two verses, but we're going to use some other verses to help us out as well. Therefore, be careful how you walk. And and for Paul, when he writes walk, he means live. Those of you guys who were here last year, live. When he says walk, he means live. It's not talking about like, you know, walking this way, right? You know, walk with this limp or walk with, you know, it's not about that. Walk, he means it's it's the day by day, step by step, moment by moment, how you conduct yourself in this life. So these verses talk about how to live carefully and how to live wisely instead of living unwisely. Living wisely, it says later on in verse 17, includes understanding what the will of the Lord is. It says it's not being controlled by something like wine, but instead being filled or influenced by the Holy Spirit. 
And in our verses tonight, verses 15 and 16, walking wisely means specifically making the most use of your time. Making the most use of your time. And and that makes sense, right? Because to let $86,000 go to waste every day is foolish to say the least, right? In the same way, to let 86,000 seconds go to waste every day is also foolish. So in these verses, we're going to see three ways to make the most of your God-given time. We're going to see three ways to make the most of your God-given time in these verses. The first way is, is to examine your life. Examine your life. Look at verse 15. It says, look carefully, or therefore be careful. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Be careful how you walk. The wise person, the wise person examines his or her own life. The wise person looks carefully at his or her own life. They look carefully at their walk in the world. The opposite of this would be to walk blindly, right? Kind of, you just close your eyes and stumble through life. That would be foolish. That would be very foolish. For me, I'm already clumsy enough with my eyes open. With my eyes closed, it's just going to be a disaster zone. We would never go through life walking with a blindfold on, but how many of us would go through life without ever reflecting upon how we're living? Without ever thinking about how we spend our time? Without ever thinking about what are our goals and are those good goals? Are, are you satisfied with how you spend your time? Or do, do you think the Lord, more importantly, would be pleased with how you spend your time? Living your life without examining your life, living your life without reflecting upon your life is like living your life going on a walk with your eyes closed. It doesn't make any sense. You know, if you can imagine, <laughs> I hope none of you guys have ever really done this or imagined this, but if you can imagine with me driving your car with your eyes closed, especially in L.A., like, how good of an idea would that be? That would be terrible. You, you might be going fast. You, you, you could be going. You might even be going fast, but you have no idea where you're going. And sooner or later, you're going to hit something, and it's going to be bad. You have no idea where you're going, and you, don't, you have no idea if you're going to end up where you want to be. There's no clue. And so living your life without examining what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're spending your time, is like driving your car to zoom along with no idea where you're headed and why. Paul says, be careful how you walk. Examine, consider, reflect. How was this past week compared to the week before? How am I using my time this year as compared to the year before? Is my life now marked by more discipline than a year ago? Is my life now marked by more love for Christ than a year ago? Why? Why not? Reflect, examine, think carefully about how you live. That's that's important. Let me ask you a question. Are you doing now? Are you doing now what you will have wished you were doing when you're 25, 30, 35, 40, 50, 60, 70? Are you doing now what you will have wished you had been doing? It's easy to live in the moment, especially in college. Just kind of do what is fun, do what is easy. But are you living in a way now that 50 years from now you will have no regrets? Are you spending your time in a way that you'd be happy about when you're on your deathbed? Are you spending your time in a way that would leave you with no shame when you stand before the Lord in heaven? Let me, let me jump from here and take you to another passage that I think will help us to reflect a little bit more as well. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians is to the left a few books. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 says, According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder. I laid a foundation 
and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if a man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Let me ask you a question. Did you know, did you know that every single person will be judged? Every single person, believer or non-believer, will be judged. There's a difference, though, between the judgment of a believer and a non-believer, right? Right? If, if, if you're a believer in Christ, you have put your faith in Christ, you will never be condemned for your sins. Because when Christ died on the cross, He was taking all of your punishment upon Himself. So if you have put your faith in Christ, you have repented of your sins, you will never be judged for your sins. But you will still be judged. You'll be judged, as 1 Corinthians 3 describes, based on how you built upon the foundation of Christ, based on how you lived, based on what you've built with, wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. You will be judged. The non-believer, the judgment is different. It, it's not about rewards. It's going to be based on what they've done in this life, their sins, and what they've done with Christ. And if that's you tonight, if you know that you have not put your faith in Christ, then you need to know what it means to even have a foundation of Christ in your life, to to have your sins forgiven, and to worry about that judgment first, before the judgment of rewards. That's something you can worry about later. You need to worry about the judgment of your soul for your sins. And so uh, I want to make sure that's clear. If you're here tonight and you don't know that, you've never heard that before, you need to understand that, that what you have done in this life, the guilt that you feel for the things that you know are wrong, you will pay for those one day if you do not put your faith in Christ. You need to know that. And God's Word makes that clear. He wants you to know that, that there's a judgment coming, but at the same time, there is a forgiveness and a salvation made available by grace through faith in Christ alone. For the believers, you will be judged not for your sins, but based on how you lived. Based on how you lived. I look at verses 10 and 11. It says, It says, according to the grace of God, which is given to me like a wise master builder, I, this is Paul talking, laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's a foundation in every believer's life. It is Jesus Christ. You don't change out that foundation. That foundation is rock solid. If you're a believer, that's there. You're saved. That's sure. That's sure. And then on top of that is your life, how you live, what you build. And it says, verse 12, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. So if you can imagine, if you can imagine you're building this structure, you're like, here's some hay, let's put some hay there. Hey, here's some wood, let's put some wood. Oh, gold and silver, we'll put a little bit on there. It's a little harder to work with, but we'll you know, melt it down, mold it. More wood, more hay, more stubble. Precious stones, throw some on there. And then, and then you have this, this building that represents your life. my mom (laughs) sorry about that you've got this this structure in front of you that that you have before you and you're standing in the courtroom of God and and this structure represents your life all that you have done in your entire life is represented by this structure and then and then Jesus walks over towards and says very nice very nice (laughs) right 
And you're like, no! And it's burning and things are crumbling and then collapsing. And in the end, you've got just the foundation is Christ. And there you've got a pile. You blow away the dust, the ash. What's left? The question is, what's left? We, we're we're going to live, you know, by God's grace. Some of you may live 60, 70, 80 years, maybe more. Maybe more if Carrie gives us very, really good drugs when she's a pharmacist. You're going to do a lot in your life. And some of it, I mean, it's not wrong to have fun and do fun things as a college student. Not at all. But, but at the end of the day, when, when, when the structure that is your life is burned up and tested with fire, what will remain? Wood, hay, straw, easy to work with, but worthless. Or will it be gold, silver, and precious stones? What, what would represent wood, hay, and stubble? It's kind of meaningless, mundane things, right? Things like watching TV. You know, I, I remember days when I was in school and I would watch sometimes a lot of TV. That's going to burn. Ten years from now, you probably won't care what you watched, let alone 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, when you are in the presence of the Lord, you will not care what happened on that TV show last week. Just take it off your DVR. It's fine. You don't need to watch it. How about school? You're at school to be here for school. Don't get me wrong. Do well in school for the Lord. You can do all things for the glory of God, even eating and drinking and taking a chemistry test. All those things can glorify God, but are you doing it in a way to glorify Him or glorify self? Are you pursuing school just to have that GPA on your resume? Are you pursuing school just to have some more accolades? doesn't even help you in life. You don't even get to use that to serve Christ or serve others. It's just for yourself as a little badge saying, I am better than someone else. Is that all school is for you? And if it is, that will burn and it means nothing. Study hard. Do well in school to the glory of God because He's given you an opportunity and a privilege to be in school. Not everyone gets to be here. If you're here, take advantage of that. Do well for the glory of God, but do it for the glory of God, not for your own. Otherwise, it will burn and it's it's meaningless. 20 years from now, 50 years from now, will you care? Will you care as much about that grade as you do now? And again, I'm not saying, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying fail your classes, flunk out, you know... F is for faithful, D is for devoted, A is for apostate. Oh. I'm not saying that, but, but but make sure that your priorities in college are aligned with what is actually real. It's so easy to live in the here and now, what seems and feels important now, but will not be for the rest of your life and for eternity. Maybe sports, maybe playing sports, watching sports, looking at statistics online. That's going to burn. That's going to burn. And (laughs) I'm laughing because I know some of you are like, well, I got season tickets for the USC football team. And (laughs) enjoy, enjoy those. Enjoy those. You know that there's nothing wrong with that, but is your life consumed by those things? Realize that those things, apart from meaningful interaction, meaningful worship to God, is going to burn. It's going to burn. Don't invest all your time into that. Maybe there's other hobbies that, that, that you love to spend time uh, doing, talking about, you know, reading about. It's all going to burn. For some of you, maybe it's video games. It's a different world today than it used to be. It used to be video games were for the 7 and 8 year old. Now it's for the 27 year old and the 37 year old and older sometimes. You know, last November I read an article about the game Angry Birds. 
And it said that in less than two years, this is last November, so it said that in less than two years, it had become one of the most successful games in the history of gaming. I'm not sure how they determined that, but... It's one of the most successful games, even though it's just a game about launching birds at thieving green pigs. The company that made the game somehow was able to track the number of hours uh, that the game has been played. People around the world, listen, people around the world have played Angry Birds for a total of 200,000 years. 300 million minutes of playing time daily. 300 million minutes of playing time daily. More than 266 billion levels of Angry Birds have been played with 400 billion birds launched (laughs) into action. At first, it's kind of funny. And then as you think about it, 200,000 years... How many lifetimes is that? Now, if you take the Bible at face value, the earth is not billions of years old. It's thousands of years old. If you gave Adam in the garden angry birds, he could not have played enough hours to match what people have played in just the past two years. It's kind of funny, but as you think about it, it's amazingly sad and it's devastating, right? I mean, just think for a moment what could have been done for the Lord with all that time. You hear stories about missionaries who go out on the mission field and die young because they go, you know, especially in the 1800s and early 19th century, you go and medicine's not great, transportation's not great. You go and you give your life for the Lord and you might see one convert. And their lives burn out for Christ in that, in that short glimmer of a moment. Imagine if... if if there were 200,000 years of time given for missionary work. Just just one year of time given to sharing the gospel with people at USC and at FIDM. What what an impact could we make? there's There's a time to... A time and a place to relax and have fun, that's not wrong. But remember, your time is not your time. Your time is God's time. Your time is time that God has given to you, that that He has bought for you. If you're a believer, your time on this life is blood-bought. Not your own. Belongs to God. You're just a steward of your time. So He's giving you a short time. And you will stand before Him one day with this edifice, this building, this structure. And it will be burned up. And the question is, is it wood, hay, and stubble? Is it, is it the meaningless things of life? Or is it, is it your time devoted to knowing Him in the Word? Gold, silver, precious stones. Is it your time that you've devoted to, to sharing the gospel faithfully with family or with friends? You don't need to be a street corner evangelist. I'm not even convinced that's the best way to go about it. But are, 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 you, are you sharing the gospel with those who are in your life, that God brings into your life, that, that are in your workplace in the future or in your classes now? Are you, are you going to be faithful and do the hard things and share the gospel then? Are you going to invest money in the kingdom? Or are you going to invest money on, on this earth? Even this past Sunday, for those of you guys who weren't here at, at church in our college group, uh, Jesse Johnson, he's one of the old uh, Bible study leaders in Crossroads. He's now pastoring in D.C. He was, he was giving the illustration that it's like you have, you have dollar bills, and every dollar bill you're either stapling a pair of wings on them so they fly up to heaven to wait for you there, or you're stapling them to earth never to see them again when you die. That was such a helpful illustration that when we send the money forward, when we staple wings on we are giving it for the Lord's work. Our lives will be tested. 
1 Corinthians 3 tells us that, that we get rewards in heaven for how we lived on earth. We get rewards in heaven for how we lived on earth. And listen to this. You have an eternity. You have an eternity to enjoy the rewards that God gives. Right? You have an eternity to enjoy the rewards in heaven, but you have only a short time now to earn them. Don't get it mixed up. Our salvation is based on Christ's work and His work on the cross alone. But our reward, our reward in heaven is based on our efforts, motivated by God's grace and empowered by the Spirit. You have an eternity to enjoy them. You have a short blink of an eye to earn them now. How are you living? What characterizes your life? So examine your life. Are you living the way you want to be living? Are you using your God-given time the way you want to be using it? Don't be like someone who's driving a car with their eyes closed. They have no idea where they're going and no idea if they're going to end up where they even want to be. You don't want to be, you don't want to be at the end of your life regretting your life. So Ephesians 5.15 says, Be careful how you walk. Examine your life. The next two points are going to be a little shorter. So don't worry, we're not going to be here all night. So the first way to make the most of your God-given time is to examine your life. The second way is to seize every opportunity. Seize every opportunity. Take hold of, grab, make, make best use of every opportunity. Look at verse 16 in Ephesians 5. It says, making the most of your time. Making the most of your time. Let me explain something. In Greek, there's two words for time. There's two words for time. There's, there's chronos and kairos. I don't usually like to bring a lot of Greek because it's like, oh, I know Greek. I don't like to do that. But this is helpful. There's, there's chronos and there's kairos. Chronos, like chronology, is just kind of time as it moves on. The second ticks on your watch, just time moving on. That's chronos. And then kairos is like a season of time, a window of time, a short opportunity. And the word here is not chronos, but it's kairos. That's why some translations use the word, not time, but opportunity. There's a window of opportunity. If, if life were like a game of baseball, which some of you now know what that is because you were at the Dodger game last week. If life were like a game of baseball, it's, it's, it's as if you are getting pitches thrown at you. The pitcher is pitching and God is pitching to you. And and you get one shot at that pitch and then once it's gone, it's gone. You don't get that pitch back. Each pitch is its own opportunity and that's it. You don't get it again. So when that perfect pitch comes, you'd better swing because you might not get a pitch like it again. That's the idea here. Take the, the, make the most use of your time. Make the most use of every opportunity. It's not just tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Use your time well. That, that's implied as well. But it's make the most of every opportunity. Are you looking in life with eyes that say, God, you're giving me opportunities. What would you have me do? Or are you just kind of going through, bumping along, not really thinking much? I wonder here if Paul had Ephesians 2.10 in mind. Look back at Ephesians 2.10. Verse 10 he says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Works don't save you, but He, he saved you for works. You get that? Works don't save you, but He saved you for works. And He prepared good works for you that you would walk in them, that you would do them, that you would live in them. So He's prepared good works for you as a believer to do. And, and I wonder if that, that was in Paul's mind as he says, take, take every opportunity and make the most of it. God's pitching over home plate. And are you swinging? Are you swinging? This is part of what it means to live wisely, to make use, the best use of every opportunity, to seize it and not let it go on you. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Teach us, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. This is what it means to be wise, that you understand the the significance of that moment, of that opportunity. When a friend asks you, what is it that makes you different? 
do you say, oh, I don't know, it's kind of weird? Or do you say, you know, it's because I believe in Christ? I still think sometimes of my freshman year in college, I had a neighbor who, who asked me, Franley, why are you always so joyful all the time? If there was ever a lob right over home plate, and I said, oh, I don't know, I'm just kind of a happy guy. I went into my dorm and what in the world am I saying? That was so dumb. Man, I missed it. I blew it. She kind of looked at me like, okay. And it went away. I was like, man, I missed it. I missed it. It was because I wasn't, I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't praying for opportunities. I wasn't ready for that. Are you, are you looking for opportunities? Are you praying for opportunities? Seize every opportunity. Because you might not have it again. That window of time, when it's closed, you might not get it back. You might not. What kind of opportunities should we seize? Well, sometimes when you read the Bible, it's, it's helpful to know the other parts of the Bible that are parallel, that kind of say similar things. Ephesians is kind of a sister epistle to Colossians. Colossians is another letter that Paul wrote. Uh, Paul wrote two letters. He wrote a lot of letters. He wrote one letter to the church in Ephesus. That's what we call Ephesians. And then he wrote another letter to the church in Colossae, which is called Colossians. He wrote them around the same time when he was in prison. And so there's a lot of similarity. And so I think it's helpful to turn there two books over to the right to Colossians and look and see what he says there. He says something super similar, really similar. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. This is what Paul says. He says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom. He talked about that in Ephesians 5, right? Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Whew, that sounds pretty similar. Then he says, verse 6, Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Let your speech always be with grace as, as if seasoned with salt. We're to have salty speech, if you will. It's flavorful. It's tasteful. It's, it's good. It's, 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 it's not dull and bland. It's not harsh and mean. It's delightful. It's delightful. It's gracious. It says, make the most of every opportunity. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward who? Outsiders. This, this has an evangelistic bent. Definitely. I mean, Paul doesn't make that as clear in Ephesians 5. He doesn't say, this is what I mean by opportunities. But for sure, that, that must have been in his mind. That, that the opportunities, some of the opportunities he's talking about is for evangelism. It is, it is for those times when someone says to you, Sean, why are you so joyful all the time? It's for those moments that you would take those opportunities. Seize those opportunities and speak with grace. Speak with humility, but speak with boldness and speak with love. Take advantage of those opportunities. You know, maybe I can challenge you to think of someone that you know who is not a believer, who maybe has never heard the gospel. Make it your goal that maybe you would initiate a conversation with them and you would ask them, hey, what happens? What do you think happens when you die? Hey, what, what do you believe about life? Or even a simple, hey, you want to come to Bible study with me? You know, don't say no for them. A friend told me that one time. Don't say no for them. You know, oh, I don't want to ask them. They're just going to say no anyway. Don't say no for them. Go ask them. You know? I would, I would love, I would love for, for each and every one of us in Grace on Campus to be, to be a faithful and zealous evangelist. You know, we're having Grub with T-Dub tomorrow. That's every other Friday. And on the other Fridays, besides that, we do campus evangelism. And I would love to see more people there because we are here on campus, not just so that you guys don't have to walk very far. But we're also here on campus because it, this is a, a great way to be a light on campus. People walking by hearing us singing. 
for us to be in the classrooms and say, hey, let me share the gospel with you. Say, oh, that's kind of weird. Maybe I'm willing to hear more about it. Hey, why don't you come meet some of my friends at Bible study? That's one of the reasons why we're here. That's why we don't, you know, carpool all the way up to church on a Thursday night. We want to meet here so that we can be a light on this campus. That's one of the reasons we do Grace on Campus, is to be a light on this campus. So I, I want to challenge you. I, I want us to grow in our love for the lost, our passion for the gospel, and our love for Christ, such that we would tell people. We would tell people, let me tell you about my Savior. And that's not easy. I, I know that's not easy. It's, it's way easier for me to do this than it is for me to talk to the person at work or to talk to the person in my class. I get that. I understand that. But I want to challenge you and challenge all of us. Let's, let's be those humble but bold evangelists on campus. And that's one of the reasons why, and I hope you join us for fall retreat, we want to talk about missions and evangelism. Sharing the gospel to those who are here in our classrooms and those around the world. Because that's... If, if, there's one, if there's one reason why we're still here and God didn't just take us home immediately when we believe, it is so that we can tell others about Christ. So, opportunities for evangelism. What else? Opportunities to encourage one another. Opportunities to encourage one another. That's why we meet together. That's why you don't just sit at home with headphones and listen to some talking head. You meet together so you see each other and can encourage one another and pray for one another. That's why we do small groups. Take every opportunity to encourage one another to be in each other's lives. And that's why I love GOC because I know that we, we have a genuine love for one another. And I, I love that. That's so refreshing to come on a Thursday night and, and, and to just be encouraged and then to come and encourage someone else. This can also apply to opportunities to, to simply know God better. To pursue Him in the Word. I mean, you know, there, there's only one book we need to know. You ever thought about that? I mean, for your classes, usually how many books do you need to buy? For your major, how many books will you have needed to have bought? Is that right? Whatever, you know what I'm talking about. For your major, you have one book. One book, not 50, not even 10, not even 5. You have one book to know God. You, you have one book to master. Are you making efforts towards that? Are you striving towards that? And there's, I'm not saying don't read other good Christian books written by pastors and things like that, but they're only helpful insofar as they help you understand this book, right? If that book that you're reading is just about, you know, some guy's thoughts about God, it's not helpful. It's only helpful insofar as it tells you more about this book. So are you, are you making every opportunity to know God through this book? A.W. Tozer, a uh, pastor from earlier last century, said this, Whatever keeps me from the Bible is my enemy, however harmless it may appear to be. Whatever engages my attention when I should be meditating on God and things eternal does injury to my soul. Let the cares of life crowd out the scriptures from my mind and I have suffered loss where I can least afford it. Let me accept anything else instead of the scriptures and I have been cheated and robbed to my eternal confusion. Let me say that last sentence one more time. Let me accept anything else instead of the scriptures and I have been cheated and robbed to my eternal confusion. We, we have one book. Make every opportunity. Take, make the most of every opportunity to know God better. So, how do you make the most of your God-given time? One, you examine your life. Two, you, you seize every opportunity. And number three, you understand the times. You understand the times. Look at verse 16 again. It says, uh, back in Ephesians 5, Making the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. There's an urgency to the command that you make the most of your time. And it's because the world around us is full of sin. The, the world around us is full of sinners who need to know Christ. Look back at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2. And it says this. 
And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This is saying that you were once dead in your sins, but not just you, but the whole world is full of sin. And not just that, but the world is under the control of the prince of the power of the air. 2 Corinthians 4 says that the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The days are evil. The days are evil because it's under the control of the prince of the power of the air, Satan, who opposes God. And so we cannot afford to just squander opportunities to advance God's kingdom. This world, by default, is is bent on evil and darkness. So when we have an opportunity to shine your light, You don't hide it under a bushel, right? If you understand the days are evil, uh, then you know there's an urgency to do what God has called you to do. You understand that He's given you this set number of days, a set number of weeks, a set number of years that you have to do the works which He has laid out before you, that you would walk in them, and he's, He's expecting you by His grace and by His Spirit to do them, to seize the opportunities. So, so you, you must use your God-given time wisely. Examine your life. Examine your life. Make that a, a frequent thing. Are you using your time the way that you will have wished you had, you had used it? Seize every opportunity. Be ready for those opportunities. Pray for those opportunities so when they come, you're ready. One of my old pastors used to say about evangelism, Whenever you're talking to someone who's not a believer, it's almost like you're playing double dutch, right? You guys have played double dutch before? You got the two jump ropes going, right? And you're kind of waiting. And you got to like time the jump to get in, otherwise the rope smacks you. And it's like you're always, you're always kind of waiting to get in with the gospel. You're, you're looking for the opportunities. You seize the opportunities. And you understand the times. You understand that the times are not neutral. This world is not neutral. And so we must we, we must have an urgency about kingdom work. So during this time in college, you, you probably have, and you might not believe this, but talk to anybody who's out of college, you have the most time you will ever have in your entire life. You 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 do. You don't get it. You don't understand me now. It's like I'm speaking Greek to you, but it's true. How are you using it? Are you becoming the man of God that you want to be? Are you becoming the woman of God that you want to be? Where do you want your prayer life to be when you graduate from college? Where, where will you have want to have grown in your knowledge? How will, you have want, how will you want to have grown in your knowledge of God and your love for God by the end of college? Are you taking steps to grow in those ways now or are you just kind of well, floating along? We'll see what happens. Brothers and sisters, let's press on. Let's work hard. Let's strive together. Encourage one another. Bring each other along and say, we want to pursue a life that is, that is not going to be burned up. We want to pursue living a life that, that is made up of gold, silver, and precious stones, not wood, hay, and stubble. Go home tonight and delete angry birds. You, you want to use your time wisely in life. Because you only have one short life to live. You know, I want to end with a, a story from, from John Piper. He, he wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Life. And he started the book with this, with this story about his father. This is what he says. My father was an evangelist. I trembled to hear my father preach. In, in spite of the predictable opening humor... The whole thing struck me as absolutely blood earnest. There was a certain squint to his eye and a tightening of his lips when the avalanche of biblical texts came to a climax in application. And oh, how he would plead. He had stories, so many stories for each age group. Stories of glorious conversions and stories of horrific refusals to believe followed by tragic deaths. Seldom could those stories come without tears. For me as a boy, one of the most gripping illustrations my fiery father used was the story of a man converted in old age. 
The church had prayed for this man for decades. He was hard and resistant. But this time, for some reason, he showed up when my father was preaching. At the end of the service, during a hymn, to everyone's amazement, he came and took my father's hand. They sat down together on the front pew of the church as the people were dismissed. God opened his heart to the gospel of Christ and he was saved from his sins and given eternal life. But that did not stop him from sobbing and saying as the tears ran down his wrinkled face, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. This was the story that gripped me more than all the stories of young people who died in car wrecks before they were converted. The story of an old man weeping that he had wasted his life. In those early years, God awakened in me a fear and a passion not to waste my life. The thought of coming to my old age and saying through tears, I've wasted it, I've wasted it, was a fearful and horrible thought to me. Grace on campus, you guys are young, and I'm young, and that story grips my heart as well, and I hope it grips yours, to say now, to to make a commitment between you and the Lord, to say, I do not want to waste my life. To find those areas, to examine your life, that need to be changed, to find those opportunities and take them and to understand the urgency of kingdom work because the days are evil. Let none of us say in the end, I've wasted it. But let us all press on and serve Christ with wholehearted devotion. Let's pray.